Thank you, President Moorhead. Welcome, graduates, families, advisors, and friends. Graduation is one of the best and purest of days. You, graduates, have achieved success, and we are recognizing it. In an imperfect world, your accomplishment is something to celebrate. Congratulations. And friends, family members, faculty members, mentors, and colleagues, thank you for supporting these graduates along their way. Graduates, how about a moment of appreciation for all of the people here supporting you? It's a privilege and a pleasure to join you. This is personal for me. Not only am I a UGA graduate, but my three sisters, Monica, Eve, and Dory, all got their undergraduate degrees from the University of Georgia. And my father was on the faculty in the Department of Statistics and Computer Science for 30 years. I grew up in Athens. I went to public schools and to UGA. I overlapped with some of the greats of our time. In my senior year, Buck Ballou threw the 93-yard pass to Lindsey Scott at the Georgia-Florida game that led to the national championship. <laughs> and I saw the band R.E.M. give a concert on the grassy field behind Legion Pool. So it's great to be back. And after that, I, like you, went to graduate school. And as a graduate student, I put a small piece into the immense puzzle of cancer. I found the gene that made a rat brain cancer grow. Now, we wanted to study that particular cancer and that gene because the same gene that made the cancer grow also allowed the body's own immune system to stop the cancer. That gene, which is called NU, or HER2, was both the cancer's weapon and its weakness. And I helped work out how it had those two faces. OK, that's good news for sick rats, as we say in science. And that would be it, except that the story doesn't stop with me. The story moves to a lab in Los Angeles that's found that the same gene is changed in some human cancers, and those were breast cancers. And then the story moves to a biotechnology company called Genentech, which used the fact that in rats, this gene could, be a, could lead to attack by the immune system to design a new kind of drug that could be used in humans. And that drug, Herceptin, was approved in 1998, and it's used for women with breast cancer. It's used to treat about 100,000 women a year who have breast cancer, over a million since it was first approved. This is a big success, but I don't want to exaggerate my contributions to it. I was one of hundreds or perhaps thousands of people who led to the development of that drug. And that's what I want to tell the friends and the family who wonder why you study sick rats because the secret of learning is that it increases, that people build on each other's discoveries, and the small discoveries become big discoveries. I am one small piece of a much bigger story. Graduates, what I want to tell you and your family and friends is how important what you've done is. All of us have seen puzzled expressions on the faces of people who ask us, are you still in school? <laughs> well, yes, but also no, not in the way that most people look at it. When you go to high school or college, your mission is to learn what is known and to build skills and to understand the limits of your knowledge. But in graduate school, something else happens. You increase the limits of all knowledge, and that is a precious thing. I'm a scientist. But I'm not just here for scientists. Scientists have good practical take-home stories, like the one about cancer. But knowledge of the human world is equally important, maybe more important, because humans are social. And we spend our whole lives trying to understand and predict and influence the behavior of other human beings. 
the tiniest baby is trying to influence its mother's behavior and succeeding. We survive because we work with other humans at larger and larger scales. So humans matter, and the study of human systems, the humanities, art, education, economics, politics, law, and business, those also create essential knowledge for all of us to build on. Practical knowledge is important, but there's more. I want to give you two images that express what I'm trying to say about knowledge for itself. I think of human knowledge as like one of the great cathedrals, like Notre Dame in Paris. These cathedrals were built over hundreds of years. The architects had been dead for centuries by the time that they were completed. There were many, many workers, and what came out of it was magnificent. In the same way, we all work together to build knowledge over years and decades and centuries. Sometimes a person has the good luck to make a breakthrough. That's like putting in a stained glass window or something in the cathedral. But the fact is, every brick in the foundation is important for the cathedral. We're all working together to build this. And we build over time. The University of Georgia, founded in 1785, is two years older than the Constitution of the United States of America. We're building knowledge for hundreds of years, and we work together in this larger cathedral of knowledge. So you, graduates, you now know how knowledge increases, and you also know how incredibly difficult and tedious it is to make knowledge increase. I'm going to come up with another image. So when you start in your learning, you don't know what's known. It's sort of like standing in a small spot of light in a room that is so dark that you don't know where the edge of the room is. And as you learn more and more, you can see that light expand around you. And then one day, you reach the edge of that light, and you realize that no one knows the answer to the question that you're asking, that, you, that, the, that the dark is not personal anymore, it's universal and you push that light forward. You change the size of the light for everyone. As a graduate student, I didn't know very much about cancer. I only really knew that very small question that I was answering, asking. But fortunately, that question was at the boundary of what anyone knew. I work on the brain now, and there, I have to say, it's still pretty dark in a lot of places, and we're working hard to create the light to put the pattern together. And many of you are also working in areas where we're trying to build that knowledge to increase that light. My favorite playwright is Tom Stoppard, and my favorite Stoppard play is Arcadia. And there's a scene at one point that involves three scholars, graduate students, Hannah, a sociologist, Valentine, an ecologist, and Bernard, a Byron scholar. And at one point, Hannah says, comparing what we are looking at misses the point. It's wanting to know that makes us matter. Otherwise, we are going out the way we came in. You, graduates, are not going out the way you came in. You found a boundary to knowledge, and you pushed a field forward. You've created a bit more light. Thank you. Finally, although I'm really here to celebrate you, I want to ask you something, too. Please share your knowledge. Share it with others in the community of experts so they can build on it, publish it. It may seem small to you, but it may be exactly the piece that someone else is missing. I work now at a new philanthropy, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. It was founded by Mark Zuckerberg, a technologist, and Priscilla Chan, who's a teacher and a pediatrician. They've been very fortunate, and they're giving away the vast majority of their wealth to try to improve the future for their children's generations. And so we are trying to make an impact in science to work towards solving diseases. And we're also trying to make an impact in education to increase the power and accessibility of education to everyone. And finally, in justice and opportunity to remove the barriers to people's success. And in every one of these areas, we find ourselves missing the knowledge that we need to move forward. You may have that knowledge or learn it. We need you to share it. And also, share your knowledge with your friends and your family and colleagues. 
Help them see why you want to know. You can do it. We're in the classic city, Athens, and the great teacher of the school of Athens, not this Athens, but Athens, Greece, taught us how to share knowledge thousands of years ago. And that was Aristotle, the philosopher and tutor of Alexander the Great. Aristotle said that there are three elements to persuasion, ethos, pathos, and logos, in that order. Ethos, who is talking to me? Why is this that I should listen to them? Pathos, the appeal to emotion and to meaning. Why should I care what this person is trying to say? And only third comes logic, the logic of the argument. I followed Aristotle today. I began by telling you who I was. I told you why you should care about increasing knowledge, which is what you have done. It leads to practical advances. And then I made an argument about how we work together to build knowledge for itself. If I can follow these rules, you can. Stop always first, though, and ask yourself, why should these people trust me? Why would these people care what I have to say? And then share. And finally, Aristotle talks about a fourth, more mysterious element, kairos. Kairos is when you speak, when conditions are right for accomplishing a crucial action, a decisive moment. At that moment, by sharing your knowledge, you can help change things. You may not know now the time that your knowledge could do that, or you may not even imagine it, but watch for it and then speak. Use your unique and hard-won knowledge to change things for the better. Share your light. But that is for the future, for another day. Today is your day. Congratulations. Celebrate. Thank you.